All right, so welcome everybody back to the conference. And um, we saw in the previous sessions that actually we can get into some spirited debate uh, about complicated issues concerning uh, behavior during the COVID, but also concerning legal reasoning versus religious reasoning. Uh, and this session is going to focus on care and caring in pandemics, clinical, psychological, and social dimensions. So uh, Professor Michael Udell from ASU will chair the session. So Michael, it's all yours. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are on the planet right now. It's great to be here. My name is Mike Udell. I'm the Vice Dean at the College of Health Solutions here at ASU. Um, been enjoying listening to some of the earlier panels and want to jump right in with some quick introductions of our four panelists. Um, and then I will have them each talk for 20 minutes um, and then we'll save Q&A for the end. I'm going to jump in and give everybody a five minute warning um, and then we'll turn my camera on at 20 minutes just to keep this on track. So the first of our four speakers is uh, Dr. Uh, y. Michael. Bari Lan, who is on the Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. Um, his work focuses broadly on moral theory and the intersections among bioethics, social history, and related normative domains such as law, religion, especially halakhic um, Jewish, Jewish religious law. You can take a look at Dr. Bari Lan's latest book, Can Personalized Medicine Be Precise? Can Precision Medicine Be Personal? Published this year from Oxford. Our second speaker will be Rabbi Dr. Uh, Jason Weiner who joins us um, from Cedar sinais uh, Medical Center here in Los Angeles, where I happen to be right now. Um, and there he serves as the senior rabbi and director of the spiritual care department. Um, he's responsible for the chaplaincy team and all aspects of spiritual care. Um, you can read two of his books, including The Jewish Guide to Practical Medical Decision-Making and The Guide to Observance of Jewish Law in a Hospital. Um, our third speaker today will be Dr. Arit Offer Stark um, from the Shalom Hartman Institute. Dr. Offer Stark is a senior fellow in the Kogod uh, Research Center for Contemporary Jewish Thought at the Shalom Hartman Institute. And her research deals with the philosophy of halakha, Jewish law, health law, and bioethics. And our fourth and final speaker um, is Dr. Janet Arison Aronson from Brandeis University, who is the Associate Director of the Cohn Center for Modern Jewish Studies and the Steinhardt Social Research Institute at Brandeis University. Dr. Aronson is interested in studying emerging trends in Jewish engagement, which present both methodological challenges for researchers, as well as substantive challenges for community organizations. So those are our introductions. Um, we'll jump in with each speaker. Um, and uh, Dr. Barilan, the floor is yours. Um, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. So there is old wisdom. It's already in the Talmud said that when plague is raging in town, you keep at home. This is the lockdown idea and social isolation were not new. And there was already lockdown in Tiberias, the smallpox. These are the memories of one of the students of Baal Shem Tov. They stayed in their own small enclosures for two months and certain communities escaped to the caves. Normatively, we do see a tension here. There is the principle we have spoken about, about pikuach nefesh, recovering a soul, the sanctity of Jewish life, which is not exactly a lachic term, as professor. And so life comes first. But there is another term in halacha or more in Jewish ethics, that's misirut nefesh, utmost devotion. Originally, it comes from martyrdom, when you have to sacrifice your own soul and not worship idols, for example. But it's commonly used to indicate the, the risk-taking, the, the um, treading the line, doing the utmost possible at great risk and price for the sake of something important and certainly the observance of religion. And there's the riddle. We, this is one photo, the event, uh, this wedding of a rebbe that uh, took place in the middle of the, in the eve of the second lockdown in Israel, infuriated many. And this is a funeral in the third wave of a rabbi who himself died of COVID and 
it infuriated people as well. And it's not just a matter of ultra Orthodox people. Um, I mean, Rosh Hashanah, I remember, uh, we were in the middle of the lockdown of the second wave working in the COVID department. I would question people how they got the disease. And many, many told me that they refrained from having the family meals from Rosh Hashanah, the New Year's Eve, upon the request of the government and in respect of the law. So they arranged the family gathering for the Shabbat, Shabbat Shuvah. To my biomedical mind, this sounds a little absurd. I mean, what's the point? But that was the logic of very many people. And here I formulated what I'm going to deal with. Are these public and deliberate behaviors violation of the principle of recovering the soul? Are these people really do not know Jewish law, banging their heads, or something different here? Moreover, if this is Mesirut Nefesh, this devotion to the Rebbe, to tradition, whatever, why risk so much for fault habit? I mean, why the family meal of Rosh Hashanah? Weddings is no religious duty. If you have the halachic perspective in your life, uh, why risk so much for something that is not obligatory? And to understand this, we try to go back historically. This is another memoir, memory of the, now for the Litvak, one of the uh, students of, of Agra from the beginning of the 19th century. And he narrates in the introduction all the troubles that fell, befell him upon coming to the land of Israel. And I wish to highlight that the plague, the epidemic was one of a list of horrible disasters that people at the time were used to all sorts of troubles. But the plague is different, at least for the fact that the way we react to the plague, coping measures are a problem. The lockdown, the isolation, the mental issues. In this way, the plague is different. I do not pretend to say more serious than uh, the mud disaster the war, the bandits, and the earthquake. And he will have to concentrate on the plague. And you go ahead to the Kaliva outbreak in Jerusalem. So it started with the local doctor. He said this was not a Kaliva, but Rabbi Salant, against medical opinion, that we, in the previous session, we paid too much respect to medical opinion. In this case, the rabbi was right. He said this Kaliva, and he canceled the fast of Tisha B'Av. This is not an obvious thing, but was not clear at all that calling off a fast has to do with Pikuach Nefesh. Sorry. <clears throat> and there are other ways that people coped with the cholera. We know them less today, or seem to know them less. First, there were the company of robbers, Joy, Yeshiva Bachorim, self-organized in processions of dancing and singing, and with an explicit purpose of boosting the morale. They were also volunteering, not only in Yerushalayim, it's a habit that began in Yerushalayim probably, but also spread in Ashkenazi communities in history of youth, and they volunteered to massage the victims of the plague. Both practices are based on the medicine of the time, the Hellenic medicine, there is uh, the idea that uh, pessimism, bad spirit, uh, uh, predispose the person to disease, especially to cholera. And there was another theory that massaging the body organs will spread the circulation and save the person. But these were highly risky activities in certain communities I'm collecting. Uh, the memory is all those volunteering to the company of rabbis, those that would do massage, uh, would die. And half the population escaped the city. That's a, an old, not necessarily Jewish way of coping with the plague. And we find here a synthesis of pikuach nefesh and mesirut nefesh. And we have to distinguish here that risk for life requires the suspension of a taboo. If a person is trapped under rubble, there is a crisis pertaining to this particular present. Within the fabric of religious life, it happens such suspensions rise forces life. 
So we know that there is a woman about to give birth. We desecrate the Shabbat, we suspend everything. And this comes from within the fabric of religious life. However, it's less acceptance in the mind of the people that suspension of religious life is acceptable. You don't suspend the fabric of life. You may suspend some laws that pass on your way of life. And I will show this ahead. Discipline was a matter. In this Hasidic story, there was a man who went to the mikveh despite the prohibition of doing so. Certainly it's not a religious duty of any man to go to the mikveh. And he died and the rabbi said he got his punishment for violating uh, discipline. So first you need the discipline. And then we have to see whether there's the discipline of communal life, what I call the fabric of life, and the discipline of obedience to positive law. And this is one of the habits that developed in Bnei Brak. You see there is a black chupa. They would do a chupa. This happened in Bnei Brak, and I show you the tradition of orphans that celebrate uh, in times of epidemic, a black chupa, and this is a token for uh, salvation, rescue, uh, mazal tov during the epidemic. And this is one of the, this is a photo from the same cholera. You see here, if you see my mouse, the black chupa. And this is the description of one of the descriptions. It's not just a minhag, the language. The pious woman collected from the market an ugly virgin beggar whose image is a recipe for puking. A groom was found, a short-legged blind man whose huge nose overlooks Damascus. In a fortunate hour, they were led to the cemetery and married with Mazalto. So here we find already the carnivalesque, the world of Bachtin, the disorder of order as a response to epidemic. And indeed, there were items related to the black wedding. They were to be orphans, dressed in black. The chupa is directly under the sky, and it's in a cemetery. And when we read for, for the reasons for this, first we see it's not precisely a Jewish idea. In the Catholic world, epidemics drove many, many couples who lived in sin to marry in church. So marriages in epidemic were common, but in the Jewish world, this was different. We didn't have the tradition of living in sin, but this is how it's explained in one or in a late 19th century book. And it, I, it's my translation. In the time of plague, every ploy and trick is done to distract the public from fear and panic. Which, we are, which are quite harmful, and to induce happiness and composure. This is why orphans are wedded, to make the world happy, because among us, the Jews, the only joy is the joy of mitzvah. We cannot frequent theaters and circuses. When orphans get married, the whole nation participates. This is rationalization. This is, we do an atmot chesed, we take the yetomim, it's a joy of Israel, we, uh, boost the morale of the people, but there is, in this halachic literature, there is avoidance of the grotesque, the carnivalesque, and the reversal aspect of this habit. But we can see from this habit, and it touches, I wish to be connected to the uh, voluntary a yeshiva bacho, groups of yeshiva bachurim that would dance and sing and walk the streets uh, during epidemics and often cross the ways of funerals, that there is much more than the dance macabre of the Christian Middle Ages. We don't have the time, but it's not, it's not memento mori, it's something different. And it has certain messages in it. It's about ordinary life is occasionally disturbed by the risk to life and temporary and specific suspension of all dynamic life to save life. So sometimes the tissue, the fabric of communal life is whole. We have a crisis, 
So there is exemption. Suspensions within the fabric of religious life, not suspension of the fabric of religious life. You never suspend this. When all the life is no more ordinary, humans cope by a defiant reverse of the ordinary. There is a combination of excess, absurd, joy, tradition, and many used to believe, and almost certainly also the Rebbe of Bells and similar leaders today, that this brings resilience, not just resilience in the selfish manner that you protect your own group, your own chatzer, but resilience that protects you from the disease. There is a medical presumption in it. And indeed, the, if we see the clash between halachic literature and folk literature, we see in this story that the, about this is a response on whether, what do you do when you do, uh, when you are sick? Does he, in eats in Yom Kippur, does he have to make a kiddush on the, on the wine? Basically, you eat the minimal necessary to sustain your life. There's rules about it. But he brings the story about the rabbi, Rabbi Salanta, that also organized uh, groups of dancers and barbers. And that when there was cholera, he had a kiddush in Yom Kippur and ate in front of everybody. So this rabbi, writing this response recently says, this doesn't fit halachic logic. You don't need to do kiddush, he doesn't need to drink wine. But we now see in the habit of Rabbi Chaim uh, uh, Salan, the reversal, the turning of Yom Kippur into a day of feast and eating is beyond managing the crisis by the minimum necessary, minimum necessary violation of halacha. It's seeing the crisis as an excess, a reversal of the ordinary. So what I want to say that the law operates on top of the fabric of life or life world, if you want to use Schutz word, it creates rules and it creates exemptions. The exemptions are part of the law. The pikuach nefesh is part of halacha. The fabric of life is beyond law. There is no system in halacha, and probably not in any other law that talks about the family meal of Rosh Hashanah, the religious event of Rosh Hashanah, the kiddush of Rosh Hashanah may be subjected to suspension, but for many, many people, the family meal, the funeral, the shiva, Numerous, numerous cases got the COVID. I lost many patients who got the COVID from the Shiva, which is also not a religious duty. I mean, it's, it's somebody should go, but it's, it's not a complete duty. In Judaism, the joys of religious life are considered protective of life. It's another layer here. When life misses its joys, the reversal calls for counter-reversal of joy in the cemetery. Then not only life isn't life, but death isn't death. In this extreme crisis, they create an experience. If life is not fully life, we don't let death be full death. And the separation between the death and the life collapse. You leave the tradition, what you call the furniture ornaments of Jewish life, even if it's impossible to abide by the laws. So you take items like chupa, like kiddush, like Yom Kippur, and they get reshuffled. In, in strange ways, but this is the situation of the Magifa as a spiritual crisis, but carried to the funny side, it's a way to boost the morale. One sets of laws disrupts another, we create boundary disruptive, disruptive habits. So every set of laws of confinement of the epidemics really met without even historical knowledge the uh, counter movement, the dialectic movement that has to do with celebration, with uh, participation in habits and not necessarily in laws. And I think these historical contexts of observation might help us consider uh, coping measures in the future.
the 19th century and the Middle Ages are still with us. And in this forum is not a big surprise because if the Talmud is so much alive, certainly all that has happened since. Thank you very much. I hope I did not take, uh, I went beyond my time. It's quite late here. You are actually under time, Michael. So that's terrific. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, up next, uh, Rabbi Dr. Wiener, um, do you need to share a screen or are you talking? Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen in just a moment. Thank you so much. It, it's really been a, a pleasure and a joy and fascinating to listen to the presentations today and honored to be part of this and to learn from all of you. Um, I, I want to share, you know, we're talking about um, how we've dealt with the pandemic in a supportive pastoral way, so to speak. And uh, even though I have a doctorate in clinical bioethics and my interest is in you know, bioethics, um, but I'm primarily coming to you today as a chaplain. That, that's my primary role. That's what I do in the hospital and trying to support patients and staff um, throughout difficult times. And you know, these past two years have been definitely um, in that category. And um, maybe I'll frame what I wanna share with the story. The very, when the pandemic began, remember we shut down here on March 13th, um, and we had, we, we started, we had an, an initial, you know, pretty significant um, um, phase. In fact, we had actually had the first COVID patient in California in our hospital, and our ICU filled up very quickly. And, you know, everyone was, it was sort of chaos, as you all remember, and, and no one really knew for sure who was supposed to do what and what's going to happen and how long is this going to be for and um, a lot of people in the hospital started, you know, in, around the world, started working from home and other people had not, didn't have that option. And amongst the chaplains, you know, here in our office, we started talking like, well, wh where do we go? Because they said only essential workers should be in the hospital. And they kind of left that for everyone to figure out, are you an essential worker or not? Um, <laughs> well, obviously you want to be essential. We want to be essential, but also people were afraid. And we had to kind of decide and no one was really telling us like, here's what counts as essential and what who should be at the bedside of COVID patients. And here's who should not. We, we kind of lean towards the side of, well, we want to be there. I mean, uh, there are people who are suffering and if we can help them, we want to help them. Of course, if that's not what the hospital wants us to do, then we won't. And on one of those very first days, uh, I remember getting a call from the ICU, from our COVID ICU. And there was a Jewish patient who was, who was dying and his family couldn't be there at the bedside. They wanted the rabbi to go say vidui at the bedside. So I thought, okay, well, you know, now I'm being asked to be there and I, I want to be able to do this for the family. And again, this was like the third day since we had shut down. And um, in fact, actually it was, the, it was the second day. It was just the second day. And I remember going up to the ICU there. And there was literally at that time an armed security guard at the door, um, only admitting those who were considered essential workers. And I walked up to the guard and I, I just like started trying to walk past him in the room into the unit. And he said, where do you think you're going? I said, well, I was asked to see a patient. I'm going to see the patient. He said, who are you? I said, I'm the chaplain. He said, no, no, no. This is for nurses and doctors. That's essential. Chaplains, I don't have that on my list. So I was a little bit, you know, disappointed. And I just thought, well, I guess it was decided. We're not, we're not essential. And I thought, am I going to argue back? I guess not. I mean, especially he's armed. I'm not going to fight with him. Um, and then all of a sudden the nurse pops out the door and looks out and says, Rabbi, there you are. We're waiting for you. And I look at the security guard and he says, oh, okay, go, go on in. So I went in and I went into the room and I said, be doing with the patient and helped out with the nurses, you know, to position the body and everything once he died. And I went back down to our office and I said to all the chaplains, um, so we were wondering, are we essential or not? It has been decided. We are officially essential. <laughs> and everyone was excited. A couple people were not. They said, well, I'm nervous about this. We said, you know what? If you don't want to go home, you can work from home. It's okay. But those who want to be at the bedside still during COVID, uh, I think that we are needed now. And let's stay here. Let's, let's stick it out. Let's see what we can do. And a lot of our support shifted to caring for staff. Of course, we, we continued throughout the pandemic to be at the bedside with patients. We felt it was important because they were so isolated and especially when they needed religious rituals. And um, it was really a comfort and it was so sad to see people die all alone. Obviously, we understand the reasons why visitors couldn't be allowed into the ICUs at that time, but um, we still wanted to be able to provide comfort and support when we could. And 
the, the, when we focus, turned our focus to staff care, this became the very, some of the very significant questions that we had. Because how much should we be risking ourselves, first of all, for the patients, and then what is our role in supporting the staff? So I, I just want to share two sources in, in my 20 minutes, two sources that kind of guided me. You know, so I'm the director of our department at, at this time. Unfortunately, I had to make difficult decisions. My staff was looking to me to guide them and how much risk should we put ourselves into? How should we guide our staff? And so first, when it came to the, to the um, patients, I want to share with you a source that came to my mind. I might be way off. I might be way off that this was not the right source, but it's just what came to my mind right away when I thought to myself, how much risk should we put ourselves into? And it's a Radvaz, responsive of the Radvaz, you know, chief rabbi of Egypt. I don't know if that was official, but that's what he was called, chief rabbi of Egypt in the 15th century. And he was asked a question. In fact, I'll put it on the screen. Just I'll put on the screen, just at least the, um, the, his, his answer, um, because it's fascinating. And I think it's relevant. The Radvaz was asked the following horrific question. I was asked my opinion, what to do if the Salton, right? The Pharaoh, I don't know, the, the, the prince, the leader of Egypt it says to a Jew, you know, in a sort of anti-Semitic way, kind of playing games with the Jews. You must allow me, you random Jew, allow me to cut off one limb Cut off your arm. You won't die from that. Oh, if, and if you don't let me, a meet Israel chavercha. Then I will kill another person from your community. I'll kill a Jew. So your choice is give an arm or someone else dies. Keep your arm, but one of your community members will die as a result. This source, as you can imagine, has been quoted for many years in relation to the discussion about organ donation. Right? How much risk should one put the, their selves, their bodies, literally into in order to um, say, help another person? Actually, just as a side point, I actually heard it quoted recently in relation to Israel's role with the current war in Ukraine. Right? There's this whole debate, and I'm not going to go there, but just to share, you know, how many ways this source can be used. You know, there's this whole debate: is Israel being supportive enough of Ukraine or too neutral? And you know, the threat of Russia. So some have quoted this source for politics. So what is the Radvaz answer? The Radvaz's answer is fascinating. I won't, won't read the whole response here just because I want to show you what, what he says. Uh, and it's been quoted halakhically in the organ donation debate. And I think it was relevant throughout COVID as well. He argues, Darcheha Darche Noam, in the second paragraph there, the Torah says, the Torah's, the, the ways of the Torah are ways of pleasantness and peace. Vitzarich, and this is a, actually quite an interesting line here. Vitzarich shemishpate Torah you Maskimim elasechel. The Torah must be logical. It has to make sense. What is logical? Vasvara and 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 right and reason. How could we imagine that someone should be required to blind themselves or yado or to cut off their hand or raglo or their leg? In order to save another person's life, he feels it goes against logic and the ways of peace for one to have to injure themselves so significantly to save another life. I do not think you should be required. However, but if someone does do this, they are pious. They are praiseworthy. Unless, if they might die as a result, meaning it depends on how dangerous it is. If it's really life-threatening, which by the way, having someone's arm chopped off in Egypt 500 years ago, that might have been life-threatening, right? Um, so if it's sakanat nafashot, if it's life-threatening, then not only is it not pious, hare ze chasid shoteh. That is a pious fool. The sveka didei adif mivade de chavre. Your doubt is more important than their certainty. And therefore, even though um, you could save their life, he, the Radvaz argued, we would not be required. So the way I guided my staff, um, and, and I hope it was right, I mean, we discussed this, but we felt, look, as long as we can follow the guidance of our medical staff and we can be safe and we can wear the proper PPE, and, and this was obviously an issue at the very beginning when there was insufficient amounts of PPE. Should we use it? Should it go to us when the nurses don't have enough? Okay, and then it should not, but, or at least unless there's ways we can minimize how much we use. But if we can be safe and we can be careful, and especially utilizing chaplains, who do not have, you know, health conditions, health concerns. That's why some people who had, had concerns did not, we did not want to put them in danger. 
So maybe in that case, it would not be obligatory, but it would be it would be midat chasidut. It would be pious. So that's what we felt. Don't risk your life, but if you're willing to engage in this behavior, it's pious and therefore a good thing to do. And um, and therefore those who felt comfortable and were able to engage in the proper um, health precautions did so. The second question was more complicated. How do we guide the staff? You know, the hospital I work in, I, I heard Dr. Wolpe talking about this earlier um, this morning, uh, or at least here it was in the morning, um, about Jewish hospitals. You know, so here I'm at Cedar sinai Medical Center. It's a Jewish hospital. So I had a role in play, in, to play in some of the decision-making in terms of HR policy for our staff. You know, as the rabbi of the Jewish hospital, they, they wanted me to help provide some guidance. Not that I had the final end-all, be-all, all the say, but at least is there some Jewish wisdom we could offer to help guide us in staff care? And I also want to share with you the source that um, I utilized for that and also the practical um, conclusion that we made based on that very specific in terms of numbers of hours, literally, staff were asked to work and how many days off they're asked to take based on this piece of Talmud. So um, here's, the, here's the source. And um, I, I'm very curious to hear, you know, definitely people might disagree with me of all this. This is just what, what uh, I utilized. And so that's what I'm sharing with you both to share what we did and especially to hear your feedback and critiques. So the source begins in the Talmud in Ketubot. The Talmud in Ketubot um, 58 says as follows. Amar of Eli. Rav Eli said, Be'usha, in the town of Usha, the rabbis gathered, they, they made the following um, declaration. Hamevazves, one who, who shares their charity, one who dispenses their money, al yevazves yotem should not give more than 20%, more than a fifth. In other words, there is a mitzvah to give maaser, to give a tenth of one's earnings to tzedakah, but they should not give more than a fifth, not more than 20%. Tanya nami hachid, the Talmud says, hamevazves al yevazves yotem michomesh, why shema yitzarech libriot? Because if you give more than 20% of your um, possessions, you yourself might become poor. And now this is referring, obviously, this is talking about tzedakah. It's talking about money. Uh, how much money should I give of my salary? What does that have to do with staff care, self-care during the pandemic? So um, there, is a tr there has been a tradition amongst rabbis for many years to apply this principle not just to financial concerns, but to personal concerns, to, to actual emotional well-being, to mental health. I'll give you one of the earlier examples, not the earliest by any means, but one of the earlier examples that I found to be fascinating and, 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 and quite profound. It is Reb Moshe Feinstein, as follows. Reb Moshe Feinstein was asked, um, as in, in, this, in this case, Nishalti I was asked by someone, and, and remember, Moshe lived in America. You know, this is the 1980s. I know that's not how they refer to mental health in Israel today. I think they call it briot nefesh, right? Or machlat nefesh. But anyways, he's referring to someone who's struggling with mental health struggles, right? So someone who has mental health struggles, the huba beit cholim, and they are in a mental health facility. They are getting treatment for their um, struggles. The nirpe, and they're doing well. They are recovering. Aval harofim rim. But the, the doctors there feel that this patient needs a few more weeks. The patient's doing well, but is not yet what we would call, you know, you know, ready to be reintegrated into society. He needs a number of more weeks. The problem is, this was in, the, in Elul and Rosh Hashanah is coming up. And, and this patient's concerned. The doctors are making me stay longer, but I want to hear the shofar. It's an important mitzvah to hear the shofar. Can't I get out of here early so I can go hear Shofar? He asked Ramosha Feinstein, what should I do? Ramosha answers, and I think this is a stroke of brilliance. So they said, Can I be re can I can we release him from the Beit Cholim from the hospital early so that he can hear the shofar? Because in that particular hospital, it wasn't Cedar Sinai, they did not have shofar available for the patients. So here's his answer. I responded, In my opinion, You do not have to take him out of there. When it comes to a mitzvah it's one is not required, as we just read, 
to spend more than a fifth of their financial well-being. Well, if you don't have to spend more than a fifth of your financial well-being, if that's nechshav ones, the potro, v'ulai gam bepachavno, and sometimes even actually less than a fifth. So now just skip, he quotes a few sources, v'im kain, and here's the, the main line here, v'im kain, kol shekain ze. Certainly in this case, she'adif adam af mi chomesh mamon, that a person will be willing to spend much more than a fifth of their financial means. And probably much more, in order to be able to be cured, to be healed. Including probably all their money. It's a, the onus of, of the shofar, of a, which is a mitzvah sase, and therefore they are pater. They are not required to fulfill that mitzvah because of the concept of hamavazves, alyavazves, yotamichomesh. So, in other words, we have this principle that not only do we not have to spend, more than a fifth of our finances. For, this is, by the way, it applies to many mitzvot. So, so example, the classic other example is, um, is, is with the etrog. The etrog, if someone could only find an etrog, it was like this in sometimes in Jewish history, right? You couldn't just go to the store and buy an etrog where, where today we have hundreds to choose from. And there were times, especially in colder places in Europe where you, know, you, don't, you, you don't have so many available. And um, what if there's only a couple and they cost hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars and you don't have that, the means? So the rabbis said, then you don't have to. So you won't have an intro that year. But it's not just about money. It's also related to your, a person's emotional well-being. They don't have to give of themselves so much that it's, they can't handle it emotionally, not just physically, but that it's too much for them to, to bear. And so in order for this person to be able to um, engage in their um, continuation of their mental health recovery, they are not required maybe not even allowed to um, leave the hospital to fulfill a mitzvah. So, and this was applied, by the way, this did come up during the pandemic. I saw this in one place, Rabbi right? Herschel Schechter from Yeshiva University wrote a number of responses about the pandemic. And one of the questions he was asked was from the Hever Kadisha. Hever Kadisha, one of their big questions was, you know, uh, to do a tahara, to do the ritual cleansing on the bodies of the, those who had died from COVID. Of course, it's a great, mitzvah and a great merit to have this ritual washing is it really you know necessarily a, a mitzvah is it a requirement um and the members of the chavrakadisha were concerned especially you know prior to the vaccine and you know there were no therapies and and they didn't want to we should they risk themselves in order to wash the bodies of the deceased which is really coming into close contact and it's not for the sake of healing it's one thing for for a nurse or, or a doctor um who are doing so for the sake of sake of you know, attempting to heal a patient, but should the Chavrakadisha, and Rabbi Hirsha Shechter wrote in his responsa um, that they are not required to, and the reason he gave was the Chomesh reason. He said that is giving more than a fifth of themselves um, in order to fulfill this mitzvah. It's not required. So how did this apply in the hospital? How did we apply this? Because, you know, this was a big struggle. As you know, I don't have to remind you. I mean, on the one hand, people were being reminded of the Hippocratic Oath and all the, you know, the social contract with humanity that physicians have taken that, you know, to risk themselves in order to care for their patients. And there isn't a, a kind of a warrior mentality of, you know, we're going to go in the trenches and help. But then there was also a lot of burnout, a lot, as we know, in many professions. But I'm talking about the hospitals now. There was a tremendous amount of burnout, tremendous amount of people feeling, um, you know, um, you know, their families were suffering. People were afraid to go home to their families. I know here at our hospital, I'm sure this was happening around the country. Uh, the hospital rented out the whole hotel next door. And many staff members were just going to the hotel. They, they're too afraid to go to their families after caring for COVID patients all day. And many didn't, you know, couldn't, um, couldn't bear that and ended up leaving the profession. So I advised our HR and our, and our um, staff as follows. Um, this was a bit, you know, went out on a limb here. And so that's why I really am curious to hear how much you disagree with me, but it, it was, it was well-received. I said as follows, if we're going to take seriously this mevazves, ayavazves, yoter mi chomesh idea and tell people you should, you're giving of yourselves. I mean, that's, that's what you're doing. You're in the healthcare profession. You are giving of yourself. You are putting yourself at risk, but there is a limit. We shouldn't give of ourselves too much. We have to also protect our well-being. We have to be in this for the long run to be able to be there. Especially healthcare providers have become especially essential because you know we need them throughout multiple ways, and we can't we can't lose them. So I said as follows: If we can't give more than a fifth, more than twenty percent of ourselves, so let's say a person works on average fifty hours a week. So I told people 
we need, you need to make a rule for yourself. No working more than 60 hours a week. Once you go over 60 hours a week, you've given more than 20%. That's more than Chomesh. You have to have a limit. You cannot go over 60 hours a week. Okay, sometimes something comes up. It's a very busy week. But, in, but on a regular basis, it would be taking yourself too far, going past the Chomesh to work more than 60 hours a week if you normally work 50 hours a week. What about vacation time? If one normally takes 14 days of vacation time a year, they should not take less than 11 days. That would be giving more than 20% of themselves. That's, they should not decrease by more than 20%. So we, we sent out the message. Everyone needs to make sure to not work more than 20% more than their norm. In other words, if you work 50 hours, don't work more than 60 hours a week. You may not. You have to protect yourself. You have to take breaks. And for vac your vacation time, you must take still at least your 11 days. Make sure to get that time off. And so this was how we tried to give a practical, um, a practical application of this principle where people are encouraged and Jewish law encourages us to care for ourselves, care for ourselves, have, have limits to care for ourselves, to not go too far and to actually put numbers behind that so that it has some teeth and it actually can be Im implemented practically. And, and that was our strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Wiener. That was a, a fascinating discussion talk. Um, really appreciate it. We're gonna move on to our Third speaker, uh, Dr. Ofer Stark. Sorry, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I will share my screen. Um, this, you see the screen? Yep. Yep, okay. Um, let's do it in the present mode. Okay, so uh, in many ways, uh, my um, uh, lecture is uh, going to address um, some of the sources and, and some of the questions that they raised in our last session. Uh, it would be interesting uh, to continue it uh, and uh, thinking about it uh, in this uh, way. One of the complex bioethical dilemmas that the corona has forced humanity to face with in the last two years is the dilemma regarding the allocation of medical resources in situations of scarcity. Scarcity, sorry. As we all remember, crises due to scarcity of medical resources have plagued in many countries around the world, and in some have even led to the collapse of the health systems. Societies around the world had to make hard life and death decisions. Who will be connected to the ventilators and who will not receive proper medical treatment? Situations of allocation of scarce resources leave the medical staff with two main possibilities. The first is to operation the resources equally, even if it means all of the patients die. And the other possibility is to determine relevant criteria for giving some patients priority over others to the end of saving as many patients as possible, even at the cost of providing medical care to only a few of them in order that at least some of them will survive. Today, I would like to, like to uh, shed some light on how these ethical questions were addressed in the Jewish halachic tradition over the generation and how it affected halachic discourse and halachic decision-making in the corona pandemic. At the end, I will also address the impact of this halachic discourse on shaping Israeli public policy. Perhaps the most classic dilemma of scarce resources is described in the Talmudic discussion regarding the case of the two people that are traveling on a journey far from civilization and one has a pitcher of water. If both drink, they will both die. But if one only drink, he can reach civilization. The Talmud presents here the two fundamental approaches mentioned earlier. When Torah advocated the value of equality, thought it is better that both should drink and die and let neither one of them see the death of the other, even at the cost of their death. Rabbi Akiva, however, advocates determining criteria for prioritization saying, and your brother shall live with you, meaning that uh, your life takes precedence over the life of the other. So the result will be that at least one of them will live. Systems of priorities appears in several other halachic sources. Among the criteria mentioned in the halachic literature, the criterion of short horizon life, chayei sha'a, gets a great deal of attention. 
The reference is to the situation of very low expensity, according to most authorities, less than 12 months as a result of terminally illness. The criterion arose much controversy in halachic discourse. Is saving the life of a patient with a normal life expectancy to be preferred to saving the life of a short horizon life patient? In other words, whether the value of short horizon life is equivalent to the value of long horizon life? The importance of a short horizon life, even extremely short, is highlighted by the Talmudic discussion in Tractate Yoma of the case of a person who was trapped in a building collapse uh, on Shabbat. And the question is arise, ar arise whether the debris may be removed in order to save him, even though it involved a discretion of the Shabbat. The Gemara determines that if there is any doubt that the person under the rubble may yet be alive, it is obligatory to save him. This determination is challenged by asking why it was necessary to know this, since it is clear that the living person must be saved. It is necessary to know this, answers the Gemara, because it adds the clarification that this applies even in the case of a short horizon life that will die soon. Indeed, the value of short horizon life in the Halakha is not considered less than the value of long horizon life when it comes to prohibition of Torah law. Everything must be done to save the life of both. However, the question arises whether the value of their life is absolutely equivalent. One reason to assume it is not arises from the Talmudic discussion regarding the prohibition to go to non-Jewish physician for healing, lest they cause the death of the patient by their ministrations. Putting aside for now the problematic nature of this statement, I want to focus on the statement mentioned in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, who despite this prohibition determines that if the patient is certain to die, he may go to an non for treatment. The Gemara challenged this, this position, why we may allow him to heal from them. There is still a brief moment of life to be considered. To this challenge, the Gemara resolves the brief moment of life is not to be considered. This Talmudic source then undermines the assumption of absolute value of short horizon life, determining that in the case of a patient who will certainly die, may go to a non-Jewish for healing despite the potential danger. The halachic discussion of the value of short horizon life versus longer horizon life led to much controversy among halachic authorities over a question raised 37 years ago with regard to the case of life support machines, which made it particularly relevant in dealing with the current ethical dilemmas surrounding the treatment of COVID-19 patients. The question was raised by an ultra-Orthodox Jewish doctor, director of the ICU in Johannesburg Hospital in 1985. At the time, the hospital had only one up-to-date ventilator, and every day, short horizon life and long horizon life patient arrived needing the machine. The accepted practice at the hospital was that when the ventilator was serving to save patient's life, it must not be disconnected. In light of this, the hospital determines that the machine should never be used to save short horizon life patient in order to keep it available for saving long horizon life patient. The doctor reported that in accordance with, his, uh, with this directive, he saved many long horizon life patients, but he was worried that he was prohibited to do this by Torah law, which would require him to also save the short horizon life patients. The question was sent to Rabbi Sternbuch, rabbi of the ultra Orthodox community in Johannesburg at the time, who proposed halachic principles for dealing with the question and consult with several leading halachic authorities. A most important response was written by Rabbi Eliezer Yehuda Waldenberg, one of the greatest halachic authorities of the 20th century in Israel, who ruled that the hospital, we won't read all of this, but the hospital in Johannesburg did well to institute the directive to use the salt ventilator only for patients who could be held and saved for long horizon life. He based his ruling on the following three principles. And here you need to trust me because we are not going to read the, all that to one now. So the first one is that it is prohibited to disconnect the patient from the ventilator once he has been connected. But while it is prohibited to actively bring about the death of a short horizon life patient, meaning to disconnect him from the life support machine, 
It is permitted to refrain from saving him by not connecting him to the ventilator in order to save a long horizon life patient. These principles applied only on the assumption that both patients are simultaneously before the saving physicians. Indeed, Rabbi Wallenberg considered the long horizon life patient who will come into the hospital as though he is actually present. These three principles are presented in the ruling as axiomatic, but in fact, they are not unequivocal. And let's look carefully at each of them. The second principle, according to which disconnecting the ventilator is prohibited, but refraining is allowed, is based on the assumption that there is an ethically significant distinction between active act and omission. It is difficult, however, not to wonder whether such a distinction is indeed justified or whether this is a moral fiction. Intuitively, it seems unjustified since their outcome is identical. After all, why does it matter how one caused the death of the patient, whether by disconnecting the ventilator or, or by refraining from connecting it when he arrived at the ICU? However, an interesting explanation may justify Rabbi Waldenberg's ruling is the argument advanced in some studies that no omission occur at all, so there is no moral problem. This explanation is based on the common assumption in many legal systems that in order to rule that omission has occurred, a source of obligation must be indicated. If there was no such obligation, then there is no act of, to omit from. Does it work in our context? Can it be argued that refraining from connecting a patient to the ventilator is not prohibited omission? Ostensibly, the halachic commandment, nor shall you stand against the blood of your neighbor, imposes a constant obligation to save lives. And those, anyone who fails to save lives have transcribed that obligation by omission. However, in the case where a doctor is faced with two patients at the same time, the doctor seems to have a halachic obligation to prefer the saving of the long horizon life patient. Thus, in that moment, there is no trans transgression by not saving the short horizon life patient, since there is no obligation here to not fulfill. As noted, this applies only in the situation where they come together. In light of this, Rabbi Waldenberg's third principle that the situation should be viewed as if they come together is understandable. This, however, may be challenged as following. Is it ethical to treat the situation in which a short horizon life patient arrives alone to the hospital as if other long horizon life patients who have not yet come to the hospital, in fact, are there? and deny him life-saving treatment on the basis of this hypothetical competing patient? Some of the Alachic authorities thought it was not. Such is the position, for example, of Rabbi Shmuel Alevi Bosnian, one of the greatest postim of the late 20 and early 21 centuries. In his response to the Johannesburg question, he wrote that it seems that this was a clear case where a short horizon life takes precedence for the commandment, nor, nor shall you stand, applies to the patient who is present before us. According to his doctrine, when a short horizon life patient is the only one the doctor sees before him, the doctor has an obligation to save him. This obligation does not apply at that moment towards the long horizon life patient who is hypothetical. The first principle underlying Rabbi Waldenberg's ruling assumes that it is prohibited to disconnect the patient from the ventilator once the patient is connected. This principle leads to the directive that the short horizon life patient should not be connected to the ventilator in order to keep it available for saving long horizon life patient. However, it may be proposed that this interdependency inter 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 is not necessary. An interesting idea was raised in this context already in the question of Rabbi Sternbuch from Johannesburg in the name of Rabbi Zilberstein. My colleague, Gaon Rabbi Zilberstein, found a workaround to connect an electric timer to the ventilator to turn it off every so often. 
And once it is off, it would be permissible to transfer the machine for the use of a long horizon life patient as it is not at that moment actually operating. Connecting the ventilator to a timer may sound like a Jewish sophistry, but it is actually a serious approach and was in fact incorrected into Israeli law in 2005. The dying patient law permits refraining in certain circumstances from connecting a terminally ill patient to life support machine, and even refraining from continued cyclical medical treatment that has already begun. The law does prohibit, prohibit disconnected a patient from a ventilator, but it determines that the ventilator may be connected with a timer resulting effectively in a cyclical rather than continuous mode of treatment. It then becomes permissible to de determine at the beginning of each cycle not to renew the operation of the ventilator. By adopting the principles of life uh, of this law, sorry, it would be unnecessary to refrain from connecting the short horizon life patient to the life support machine. Any patient arriving who needs the ventilator at that moment could be connected with the understanding that even if it is prohibited to disconnect him, there will be in which it would be legal to not renew the operation of the machine and transfer it to patient whose prospect of survival are greater. The principle mentioned in a Rabbi Waldenberg's ruling impact the halachic ruling relating to the COVID-19 patient too. An important ruling whose publication made waves in the American Jewish community in the face of the threat, threat of the severe security stress the, oh, sorry, Milaka Shadi, of ventilators was issued at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020 by Rabbi V. Schechter. We heard about it earlier. Um, similar to the principles mentioned in a Rabbi Waldenberg ruling, Schechter also ruled that when two patients reach the hospital at the same time and there is only one available ventilator, the one most likely to be saved should be connected to the ventilator. If, however, they arrived one by one and the first was already connected to the ventilator, it is prohibited to disconnect him even if he is very old and sick and it is doubtful that the treatment will save him and the later arriving patient is young and healthy. Nevertheless, he rules that even if the doubtful patient arrived first, but it is known that within an hour or two, younger patient will arrive, that situation may be viewed as though they arrived simultaneously. So that the very old patient should not be connected to the ventilator. So it may be reserved for the younger, healthier patient, as we will preserve more years of life if we treat the younger, healthier patient. The use of these terms indicates a criterion of age that may be illegitimate and naturally we must discuss separately. Rabbi Schechter concludes his response with the most important remark, possibly revolutionary, revolutionary from a halachic standpoint, about the once accepted practice in the US connecting several patients to a single ventilator. In this case, in these cases, patients arrived at the hospital separately and were each connected to individual ventilators. After a time, when they showed similar characteristics, they were disconnected from the separate ventilators and reconnected to a single machine in order to make additional ventilator available for the patient, for an, uh, other patients. While disconnecting the patient from the ventilator is prohibited in order by Schechter's view, he nevertheless premised this practice and rules that the, the patients were connected to the first ventilators for a limited time and conditionally. In his words, when we designed ventilator A for a patient A and ventilator B for a patient B, this was only for a few days because this was the intention a priori to disconnect each patient from his ventilator and use the machine for another patient who had not yet arrived. Can this reasoning be used also as a basis to permit disconnecting a patient from a ventilator in order to save another patient with a more hopeful prognosis without connecting the first patient to a shared ventilator? This implication does not explicitly appear in the ruling. 
Another halachic position influenced by the halachic principles mentioned heretofore was included in an official position paper, paper on precedence of severe COVID-19 patients published in Israel by a joint committee of the National Council on Bioethics, the Ethics Committee of the Israel Medical Association, and the Ministry of Health. I'm about to finish, I see you. <laughs> okay. The religious subcommittee's statement of opinion mentioned that the halachic principles for determining precedence is the consideration of the patient's medical condition and uh, the chance for success of life-saving treatment. The committee clarified that the physician is not allowed to disconnect treatment that has been started, even when the short horizon life patient was followed by a long horizon life patient. Nevertheless, the committee determined that in the case where a critically ill patient was put on a ventilator, and it turns out that his chance of survival are very slim, no new life extending or life supporting medical treatment should be started. Moreover, it is also permitted to gradually reduce the ventilation rate and the oxygen in the ventilator. And this should not be returned to their former levels, even if the patient conditions get worse afterwards. In this period, it was also determined that a COVID-19 patient whose prognosis is for a slim chance of survival may be moved from the ICU in order to make a bed available for a patient with a more hopeful prognosis. Since a patient defined as a long horizon life, takes precedence over a patient defined as a short horizon life. To conclude, alongside the great difficulty of deciding ethical dilemmas during the pandemic and in other extreme situations, such as triage, triage decision making in a field hospitals in Ukraine nowadays, perhaps the knowledge that such dilemmas occupied the attention of Palachic authorities as of all humanities through the generation may provide us with support. Despite the difficulty of making life and death decisions, it has always been important to deliberate over the ethics and values involved. Thank you, Dr. Offer Stark. That was a great talk. Um, we're gonna keep things moving and we'll have questions and discussion at the end. Uh, Dr. Aronson, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, this also uh, is interesting um, tie-ins with the previous session because some of these issues came up in terms of halakha as well. Um, what I'll be presenting, we, we've talked about a lot of the medical responses, scientific responses, halakhic rabbinic responses, and this is really a different view looking at communal responses to the pandemic. I want to bring, bring us back to the beginning in March or April of two years ago and thinking about what were communal concerns, what was stated um, at the very beginning. And I just drew a selection of comments from eJewish Philanthropy, which is a online website newsletter that Jewish professionals talk to each other um, here. And the immediate need, the highest immediate need was obviously health and financial concerns. And the greatest concern clearly stated was about elderly, poor, isolated individuals um, and how they would be faring. Um, the second concern, and there was obviously much more, but um, just to, this is a summary of comments. The second concern that I heard was how Jewish institutions would fare, um, how synagogues would manage when nobody was um, in the building, how Jewish education would continue to be provided for students, and how Jewish professionals who were not trained to uh, run Zoom rooms would pivot to the needs of the community um, in light of not only sustaining the community, but the great financial and health uh, needs. And finally, the larger question of just how are we going to sustain Jewish life? Could we sustain it online? What were some new forms? Would people uh, be turning to Jewish life at home? So how do social scientists respond to pandemics? We conduct surveys. So that's what we did. Um, I'm associate director of the Center at Brandeis where we normally study Jewish communities. Um, uh, the, there were about to be a number of surveys to go in the field. We put the brakes on those and instead conducted a survey 
of, it turned out to be about 15,000 respondents from 10 different Jewish communities throughout the country uh, in waves from May to July of 2020. Uh, some other organizations conducted surveys as well. The OU conducted studies of the uh, Orthodox Jewish households um, in the summer of 2020. And UJA Federation of New York conducted a major study in uh, the following year in 2021. Most of the data that I'll be presenting for you today is from the Brandeis study. So this is back early in the pandemic. Um, so I wanna to turn to a few of these topics. So first one, the health and financial well-being of members of the Jewish community. Um, we found that 11% of households in our survey said that they were struggling financially, which means they described themselves as saying they either could not make ends meet or just managed to make ends meet. This was before the pandemic. This is where how they, how they described themselves. Now, although we also often have the picture of the people who are poor as being this elderly, isolated, not working, in fact, about a quarter of this group were indeed retired over age 75, but a third of them were under age 50, four out of 10 had a graduate degree, and four out of 10 were employed full time. So these were the characteristics, and this continues to be true in the Jewish community, that the people who are struggling um, are often um, working uh, middle-class people. Uh, sorry. Um, so what happened to these people during the pandemic? It turned out that um, as with the entire uh, country, um, the financial uh, situation was hardest for those who were already financially struggling. So you can see that of the people who said they were financially struggling, 44% said that their situation got worse during the pandemic. And of all these other groups who were doing better, although many of them said that it got worse, it was much smaller shares. Um, a almost a quarter of them either lost a job or was furloughed for a job from a job. A little bit less of this next category who said they had enough money, but of people who had a little extra money or were well off, very few of them either lost a job or were furloughed. Um, we heard, I think in the earlier presentation about the mental health crisis, and I'm gonna be spending some time talking about that. Unlike uh, what was expected, that we would see this uh, great emotional distress among isolated uh, elderly people who would not be able to be uh, maintain, uh, easily maintain uh, connections through Zoom. It turned out to be a very clear pattern that it was the youngest adults in the community who are reporting the most uh, emotional difficulties during the pandemic. And I think as was stated earlier, we found this in the Jewish community and then it was replicated throughout the United States in many, many studies. So fully, uh, this is of people who were financially struggling prior to the pandemic. Um, two thirds of younger people said that they had emotional difficulties in the past week. And also similar share said that they felt lonely in the last week. Um, even though a lot of people experienced both of those feelings, um, it was highest among these young adults. Now, um, again, we thought it was a little surprising because we thought that young adults would have the easiest time maintaining um, connections virtually. Um, so we thought, well, is that why that they actually don't have these social networks? So it turns out looking at the same group that Almost everybody, that's the blue bar, almost everybody had contact with somebody, a friend or family um, in the week prior to the survey. So there was a lot of contact going on. And we also asked people, um, how's your support network? Do you have a group of people that you can rely on, a friends or family who live close by? And it turns out that these young people had the strongest support networks. More than half of them said, that they um, have people that they can rely on. Um, the older people have fewer support networks. So in fact, they were a little bit more isolated, but it's the, so the younger people who are experienced these um, emotional health challenges. So what is the reason? It's clearly was isolation. And here are some comments from some of the participants. 
Staying home without direct human contact for a very long period of time has been rough, even with heavy use of electronic and phone communication. Personally, the hardest impact has been how lonely I am. I am used to spending time with lots of friends and family and being completely alone is really difficult for me. The last person said a sense of isolation, inability to visit and celebrate with family, frustration and anger with federal and state governments response to this crisis. And I wanted to leave that in just to remind everybody in case anyone forgot that um, over the course of that summer, the crisis in the United States expanded. It was already, and there was a crisis around the political system about the election. And then we had the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter response to it. There were many, many reasons to be in crisis um, at that time and that continued. And I think that some of them may have affected uh, young adults uh, more, uh, more strongly. Another group that there's a lot of concern about is children, school-age children. And at this time of the survey, most parents said that they were coping well, and most parents thought their, their children were coping well. However, most parents, and that's these orange bars, um, were somewhat or very concerned about their children's emotional and social well-being. And this is for college students, K through 12, and preschool. So of all ages, there was great concern. I imagine um, if this survey were taken later or today, there would be even greater concern. And this is not even to mention the loss in the academic progress um, over those years. Now I wanna to turn to the question of Jewish institutions. How did they fare? How did they respond? Um, one third of Jewish adults in our survey told us that they were not contacted by any Jewish organizations in the first month of the crisis. Now, um, a lot of Jewish households are not known to Jewish organizations that are not connected. But in this particular case, because we did the survey, every household in our survey was on a federation, a local Jewish federation list. So they were known, they were connected to at least one Jewish organization. Um, another sort of limitation on this is that we just asked, were you contacted? Now, some people might see uh, a mass email from their synagogue and, and consider that a contact. Some people might say it doesn't count as a contact until um, someone, till my rabbi picks up the phone and calls me. But be that as it may, the experience of respondents and feeling connect, contacted and, and connection and, uh, is what really matters here. And I think what's particularly noteworthy is that only a quarter of all of our sample said that a Jewish organization contacted me to offer me any assistance. And less than half said a Jewish organization contacted me to say, how are you doing? So what's the implication of this? Now this next slide is synagogue members, people who are members of congregations asking them how did their synagogue fare? So the good news is very few people said, I think I'm gonna leave my synagogue. Some people did because of financial reasons, but only five, less than 5% said, I think I'm done with my synagogue at that time. Um, and most people rated their synagogue's response to crisis uh, very high, almost half said it was excellent. And then a good uh, number of others said that it, the response was good. However, I wanna bring back that point about the importance of contact with organizations. So when we divided by the people who heard from their synagogue and the people who didn't, of the people who had contact with their synagogue, someone had contacted with them, well more than half said that my synagogue's response to the crisis was excellent. Of the people who had not been contacted, only 17% said their uh, congregation's response was excellent. I'm going to be uh, coming back at the end to sort of talk about what all of this means, but I wanted to lay the groundwork of what we found. Uh, now I'd like to turn to the subject of Jewish life, and this did come up earlier, um, the great excitement about online Jewish life. And would this be the opportunity to bring in loads of people who had been sitting by the sidelines before, maybe they couldn't and they didn't have the time or the money to access Jewish 
programs. Maybe there was nothing local that available to them locally. Um, and um, and maybe they couldn't afford it. And a lot of the online uh, programs were, were free. So would this be this booming opportunity to reach new audiences for Jewish life? So we did find some evidence of that here, are some nice quotes. Uh, one person said that because now we're at home, we can all get together and have Shabbat dinner and uh, attend services online as a family. And that was the first um, chance they had had to do it. Another person said, we get together with our whole extended family on Zoom um, every Shabbat and have a meal together. And we love this new tradition. And we think we're gonna do this after uh, the pandemic is over. Um, but the third quote in here, I think it's really important. The biggest personal impact of the pandemic is isolation. It is confirmed for me that being with and around people is indispensable. This cannot be overcome with technology. And I think that, you know, as we're meeting on Zoom today, I think that we all have know, know from our personal experiences the pros and cons of being on Zoom. So this raises the question, who was per participating in all of these online Jewish programs that um, became available? So <clears throat> we asked people first, prior to the pandemic, about how often did you do any Jewish programs? And they could say never, less than monthly, monthly or more, or weekly or more. And then we said, in the past month, how often did you do any online Jewish program? So it turns out of the people who said, I never did anything before the pandemic, they never did anything online either. So we did not see evidence that um, these people were grabbing this opportunity to jump online. Very few of them did. Um, on the other hand, of the people who said, um, I did things at least once a week before the pandemic, they were the heavy users of online Jewish programs. So I think um, what's pretty clear that happened is, yes, even though there were a lot of online Jewish programs that were booming during the pandemic, most of those were not new audiences for Jewish life. In fact, they were people who were already doing things and they were um, sort of transferring and they were expanding their horizons. They were reaching new programs. Um, I think that that's really valuable, but it raises some questions about what's going to happen um, after the pandemic, which I'll come to at the end. Um, what about belief? What about faith, belief in God? So this is some um, information from that study, the OU study of Orthodox Jews. And they found that um, people who felt closest to God um, reported a, a real deep uh, faith in God. Those people experienced lower levels of depression and anxiety. They had lower stress and a decreased sense of loneliness compared to many other Orthodox Jewish adults. And there were some uh, lovely quotes about people's sense of how faith helped them through um, through this crisis, for example, I'm incredibly grateful and feel a strong sense of bracha. This has all hit the reset button on my relationship with Hashem, creating a regrounding and has made my sense of Hashem and his presence with me more palpable and strong. So now to turn to the future of online Jewish life and the implications of all of these findings. So, um, what we found is that of the people who were doing um, online Jewish life regularly, most of them expected to continue. So the people who did it often, nearly all of them, were pretty sure that they were going to continue to do uh, use online re resources um, after the pandemic. And even of those who rarely use them, um, about half said that they expected to continue. So I think that, again, this points to the need to, to plan to continue this form of Jewish life. Um, I don't have current data about the Jewish community, but I thought I would just share this study from the Pew uh, Research Center. This is about all, uh, all Americans, but it's current, just, from, just came out last week and, and the study in March, 2022. What happened to religious service attendance? So this line is going from July of 2020 up to this month. And the orange line is people who attended online. And so you can see 
there's a gradual decline of people um, attending online. And then in September, from September 2021 to now, it's pretty much flat. It didn't continue to, to decline, but um, it didn't rebound as uh, the pandemic, as things closed down again either. Uh, in terms of in-person attendance, uh, only a third of people, uh, I'm sorry, I should qualify. These are all of people who attend services at least monthly before the pandemic. Again, not Jews, any religious services. So these were the regulars um, in church. Um, and uh, about a third of them were attending in person um, in the July of the first year of the pandemic, slight increase and a big jump in September. And then again, not really continuation, not continued growth, continued flat. In total in March, 88% of people who used to attend monthly said they attended in March. Now, I would love to see this extended out in another month or two now that I think things are really starting to open, um, but it just gives us some indication. Okay, I'm gonna just conclude with what, are, what do we expect to see? Okay, after two years, can we expect to return for Jewish life to return to the status quo from before the pandemic? So some things I think that the Jewish organizations should be keeping in mind. First of all, this issue of mental health uh, and we need a renewed attention to mental health needs, particularly among young adults and children. This is a national trend. It's not limited to the Jewish community. And I think we ought to be thinking about loneliness as a community priority and what can Jewish organizations um, do to, to address that. Second, um, we should be looking at financial needs and a renewed attention to the economic divide between the haves and the have nots in the Jewish community. And keeping in mind that people who are financially struggling are not just those who are poor and can't buy food, but it's many working, housed, uh, highly educated families who are really struggling to make ends meet. And um, as government aids continues to decline, how will this group be adversely affected? And in terms of Jewish life, I think that the role of Jewish organization is going to continue to need to be what it always has been, which is to outreach to its members and to create personal connections between people, um, between each other and between um, leaders and, and members of organizations. And we should be thinking about online Jewish life as a complement and not a substitute for in-person Jewish life. And I'd love to see creative thinking about kind of hybrid models like have a remote uh, lecture by a great national speaker, any of you on this call, and then um, have in-person groups so that people can really connect individually. And the last thought to leave you with is just as the beginning of the pandemic required thoughtful responses from Jewish organizations, so too will this post-pandemic transition present new opportunities and challenges. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Aronson. Um, and thanks, of course, to our four panelists today. Um, I, in the interest of time, I think we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. I wanna open it right up um, to our audience and to other panelists um, on the Zoom with questions. Um, so why don't we do that? And I'm also happy to jump in with a few questions if uh, folks are slow to get started. So any immediate questions folks wanna jump in on and panelists can ask fellow panelists questions as well, of course. All right, Hava. 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 Yeah. go ahead. Uh, I have a question. I would like to combine uh, the presentations by Jason and by Irit. Um, Rabbi Weiner, you are in a, in a hospital, you get non-religious Jews as, as your secular Jews who end up there. To what extent your decision-making, your thinking about the problem, the way you even frame the problem can help address the, the distress that this individual and his family or her family experience at that point. In other words, I, I would like to highlight a certain gap between the halachic discourse and the reality of secular Jews in America? 
That's a great question. And absolutely, of course, you're right that I'm, I'm a rabbi for all Jews here. And of, of course, like everywhere, majority are not Orthodox or observant of halacha. And, and that's actually why the, the sources that I shared, you know, I'm really trying not to use strictly halachic sources, but trying to find more general Jewish values such that someone who doesn't speak the language of halakha or isn't concerned for themselves about following Jewish law per se, but oftentimes, especially in difficult times, is interested in Jewish values. What does the Jewish tradition, what does Jewish wisdom have to share that can provide some guidance? And, and I especially find personally in the hospital and in general difficult times that um, someone might not live their life such that every day, every decision they make is based on Jewish values, but when decisions are especially difficult or feel like they're especially um, um, meaningful decisions that many people, many Jews do want to have some input, at least in their decision making from Jewish values. And so that's why the goal of what I presented was not specifically halachic or legalistic, but more values based. Because I think that can speak to more people. Thanks. Um, Dr. Aronson, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I have a different question. And this is for Irit. Um, and I'm glad to have the chance. This is something that's been on my mind. And I know you said that um, it's really complicated to think about uh, allocating resources on something other than age and health status. But I was wondering, tying into this uh, vaccine uh, hesitancy, is it can you? Um, use, how, how do people's medical decisions fit in? Like if someone um, refused a vaccine and then showed up uh, in need of care, can you ethically use that as a reason to uh, divert resources to somebody else? Maybe I will uh, join uh, some parts of, uh, of the answer that Jason uh, just uh, mentioned, um, that I really believe um, in my research, at least, um, my goal in my research is to try to take out from the halachic, um, uh, you know, uh, scope of view and the, the value discourse. And I don't think there is a halachic way that we are looking for. There is no final answer, I think, in regard uh, of all of the issues. There is many halachic ways. And I think that the usually, as much as I know, as much uh, as I uh, figure out in my researches, usually in each of the, uh, you know, of the issues that uh, the halach, the, the halacha treats, uh, you can find, you know, many voices. Um, so usually my answer is that, uh, that there is no halachic answer to, you know, to some issue. And I can guess that, yes, that, that, that if you want to find some voice that will justify something that, so my feeling is that you will find it in the halachic discourse, at least when you are talking values and you don't, you are not looking for, you know, a, for the final solution, uh, my, my, you know, what the halakha rules at the end of the day, but what was the uh, values that lead to the end of the, of, of the ruling. So I guess that, that uh, would be my direction. Um, um, it's also, I think, um, I mean, uh, it's also answer the question, Chava, that you raised uh, before maybe regarding the, um, the gaps between the, you know, the halakha and, and maybe maybe the point of the decision making, especially of the end of life. I would say maybe Professor Barilan can uh, say uh, more uh, from the reality than me. Um, uh, but uh, I think at least in Israel, uh, when people come to end of life decision, it is a, um, uh, uh, many of them, even if they are not a religious people, are one, you know, at the end of life decision, want to hear what al is have to say about this, uh, how the life and death, uh, you know, decision, decisions. And then I think um, that it is really interesting who they are talking to. I mean, usually in the public policy, it's really um, easy to hear all the extreme voices in the name of the al they are coming and saying, no, it's the al say that it's. But if you are going to more liberal, you know, um, 
um, rabbis or um, or ethics committee that uh, you know people that are coming to the ethics committee uh, in the hospitals, then you can find the value discourse that we are talking about and the different voices that in the halachic discourse. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Barilan, did you want to jump in? Well, if we punish the non-vaxxers, we'll have to punish the smokers, the gluttons, those who neglect the diabetes. It's a huge issue. In the response literature, there are discussions of the duty of pidyon shuim, of people who are to blame for the situation. So there are sometimes limits are set usually to, to avoid slippery slopes, but people abuse the system. But uh, the idea that we treat people following their behavior is uh, very problematic. There's no way somebody who has been no vax, but he served in a combat unit in the military or his uh, grandfather was fighting as a partisan. The balance of merit is endless. Everybody here, at least in Israel, I know about the situation in America, but all patients in Israel deserve the best, they sacrifice most, and if they have not done it personally, their relatives have done so. Great, thanks. Um, we're just about out of time, but I, I just wanted to ask uh, Rabbi Wiener one question. Um, you spoke about, uh, very eloquently, about how you came to decisions about risk for the chaplaincy team. And you spoke, uh, you, you alluded to the fact that your team um, was, was okay with the rationale and decisions that you made. But I, I wonder, was there any resistance as you made that decision? Um, how did the team process it, uh, you know, given the intensity and unknowns at the beginning of COVID? Uh, yes, we, we, we had, and thank you for your kind words. We, we had a lot of diversity amongst the opinions on our team. And so we tried to be very careful to uh, embrace that and allow people to make different decisions, um, you know, to prevent sort of resentfulness about people who make different, different decisions. And there was, we had to have some, you know, difficult and open conversations amongst the staff to be very clear about um, our plans and, you know, the fact that Many of us were going to continue to see patients, including COVID patients, but that no one should feel ex expected to, and that people who did not feel comfortable, there would be no retaliation or any kind of you know different treatment. Um, th the vast majority, almost everyone in our department, wanted to be able to continue to um, provide support to the patients. That's where really the self care kind of piece came in then, because it was like, okay, wow, everyone really wants to do this, but we need to also be careful about how gung ho we are about this. Right. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for talking a little bit more about the, that issue. And again, thanks to all of our panelists and we'll wrap things up now. Um, Hava, turning it back to you. Yeah.